the subject, do animals have rights? Well, the answer to that, of course, really depends on who you're asking. You have that set of dedicated animal lovers to whom the answer is yes, but of course, of course they do. How could we let them suffer? We have to do what we can to keep them safe. On the other end of the spectrum, you probably have those who hunt for pleasure, who think nothing of seeing chickens tied upside down on a fast-moving vehicle, or who tie up a dog or beat a dog for, and don't seem to think that that is a living animal with feelings and pain and fear of its own. And in between, you have millions and millions of people who may not consciously want to hurt an animal or cause it fear or pain or suffering, but who by their lifestyle choices, by their turning away from some very big questions, may actually be causing that animal suffering in many ways. Maybe not directly, but having an impact on that animal. So in this land of Ahimsa, we have healthy street dogs battered to death. We have a police horse Shaktiman who dies after being assaulted by a politician. We have, of course, those, that hot topic, Jallikatta, and here in Karnataka, Kambala, the plea for the revival of that after the Supreme Court has said that it should be banned on the basis of cruelty. We have laws in this country to protect animal rights. We do. We have many laws in this country to, for many, many different issues which are not always followed. We have laws for animal rights as well, but what are the penalties for violating those laws? 10 rupees? 50 rupees? We have a great panel here today, and I'll be starting by asking them their initial responses to that very question, do animals have rights? First of all, Amala could not be with us here physically today. She's not been well, but she was very keen to share her opinion on a subject that is very important to her. So let's just first hear Amala's thoughts on do animals have rights? It's based on the premise that they deserve freedom from cruelty. There are those of us who understand animal suffering. We see it, we understand it, we're able to connect to it, and therefore we choose to voice this suffering. This has kind of formed into the animal rights movement. Um, it isn't a trivial subject because the suffering is real, whether it's in the circus, whether it's in animals, used in entertainment, whether they're in the laboratory, the scientific laboratory, or in the farm or the slaughterhouse, whether they're in our homes or on the streets. The abuse of animals is very blatant and it's very obvious and it causes a lot of pain and suffering. When we see this pain and suffering, when we see this abuse, this trauma, this torture, we believe that it should be stopped. The animal laws, protection laws, are meant to stop this. And the animal rights movement is meant to protect them. Abhi, I'll come to you first. Clearly, of course, nobody would endorse such viciousness towards animals. But when it comes to the conflict between animal rights and human rights, in that context, do animals have rights or do we always take precedence? So um, let's start by defining what an animal is. Um, you know, everyone thinks automatically they know what an animal is. Uh, but under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, an animal is defined as any living thing that is not a human. So it basically should be the Prevention of Cruelty to Life Act. Um, now, if you think about it, in which case you've all, everyone here, has committed some cruelty today to an animal. Okay. Um, can there be an equivalency of rights between animals and humans? Um, there's, always a, there's always a gradation, right? Even with, first of all, even between humans is a gradation. I will first protect my own life versus a stranger's. I will first protect my own kin, my children's or my family's life before anybody, before I can even think of anybody else's. Okay? So if you think about um, rights in terms of the, uh, the right to life, then clearly, as human beings, we will put the life of a human being before the life of any other, uh, any other being when given that choice. That is not to say that we should take those choices trivially or, or lightly, or that, um, that animal welfare, no, there are two things, that animal welfare versus animal rights, right? Nobody here can deny that animals should be treated well. OK? 
Okay? The welfare of animals as much as possible in our care should be, should, should be, of as, uh, should be as high as possible. Ashwin, I, I know you're coming from a background of animal welfare, animal activism, but isn't this getting too sentimental? Don't human beings always have the prior rights to life, to safety? Animals don't have rights, correct? There are regulations, there are certain rules that say that human beings should treat animals in a certain way, but that does not give animals any kind of rights. And uh, the actual question is, I think, now it's coming down to should animals have rights, yeah. right? That's what people are actually debating, should animals have rights? And uh, a most major part of at least the welfare community would say yes, but there is a certain portion of society that says no, no they don't need rights. It's just that you know, humans have evolved and we are going to control how yeah. every other yeah. being and would survive. And animals are there for our use, our are entertainment. Are there for our use, exactly. Our, yeah. And they, we are going to decide how they survive and whether they should yeah. survive or not. Uh, we'd asked Amala also about whether she felt that was the case, whether she felt that animal welfare groups were at a very difficult spot right now and what their role was at this point of time. Here's what she had to say. It's true, the suffering of animals bring up very strong emotions, especially if you've identified with animal suffering and if you've befriended an animal ever in your life, it brings up very strong emotions, which could be misunderstood as sentimental. And just as there are diverse uh, people in the media or in the, the film industry, there are diverse people in the animal welfare movement. Each come with their own agenda, their own baggage, whether it's from a religious perspective or whether their guru has told them to do something or it's an ancient text that has been written thousands of years ago or if the person is driven simply because they want to do something for the betterment of society. So we come with diverse backgrounds and agendas and we come with diverse abilities and skills. Some of us are not so skilled in communication, some of us are extremely skilled in communication. The point is, in this environment, yes, it is a great challenge when you're labeled and you're boxed and you know, you're uh, not taken seriously. It is a great challenge to get the message across, but I think it starts with communication. I think it's a wonderful thing that the Hindu huddle has given animal rights a platform uh, and a panel to discuss it. It starts with discussion. It starts with the interest to understand the issue first. And in that understanding, see what solution can be made. Because I think there has not been a single audience until date where I have spoken and they have not accepted that the suffering of animals is totally unnecessary. Coming to the other big topic, which has probably the most animal-related issue that has grabbed the headlines of late, I'm talking, of course, of Jalikata next door, the response it got when it was banned and the people's movement to bring it back again. Norma, as a legal mind, what does this really mean when the Supreme Court can say something, can ban something on certain grounds, but state governments then feel that they can bring in a law or an ordinance. It's happening here in Karnataka as well, for uh, Kambala. Well, you need to see the framework of the Constitution. Uh, in the Constitution, there are certain areas which are called concurrent subjects. And in the concurrent list, both the center and the states have power to make laws. Now, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act is, an, is a central act. So central law would prevail over the local or the state legislation. So therefore, if there is something which is contrary to it, uh, like a municipal law or any other state law, the central law would prevail. But it does not take away, because we are a federal federation also, it does not take away the right of the state to legislate as well on those subjects. Normally, the states, because of certain particular features, inherent to the state or relevant to the state, would make law which is in line with the central law. That is permissible. But if the state makes law which is contrary to the central law, or which is, appears to be contrary to the central law, then it needs the presidential asset, assent, assent to the president under Article 254. 
Now, the president did give assent to the state law as so far as Tamil Nadu is concerned. So, what is the solution? Because you now have, the issue is twofold. One is, you could challenge the state law on the grounds that the president was not properly apprised of the relevant circumstances and factors relating to the state law. Because after all, it's an understanding of the president as to what is the purpose of the law, and the president might come to a conclusion and you could assail that law on that ground. But we may be on a little bit risky ground here. Therefore, the challenge that has been taken up in the Supreme Court right now is not on whether the president was properly apprised, but the challenge is that the Supreme Court has already spoken on the subject. So in addition to the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, you have a Supreme Court judgment, and therefore what is being challenged in the, uh, the, the Tamil Nadu Act, therefore, is is the act deliberately and directly opposed to the Supreme Court judgment. That is the issue which the Supreme Court will now have to look at and resolve. Let's see what Amla had to say on the issue. Uh, I grew up in Tamil Nadu, so I connect very strongly with um, Tamil culture. Um, but I feel Jalikattu and the, the, the discussion on animal rights in Jalikattu has been misunderstood. Um, it is very important for celebrities to support because um, they get public opinion, they can sway their influences, they sway public opinion. But here I think Jalikattu was hijacked by politics and um, it is a known fact that the Tamil film industry is financed and funded by politicians and um, if you speak out uh, against any political agenda then your film won't release or you won't have work. So um, I can well understand why they all came out in support. But um, the point is that it has been misunderstood. The truth is the, the, the discussion was about how the bull's uh, tails are broken, uh, chili powder is put, rubbed into their eyes before they are sent into the arena so that they are totally blinded and they are starved sometime before that and given uh, country liquor so that they do not know what they are doing, they are kind of overwhelmed and their senses are out of control and in this in this state of terrible trauma and suffering, this whole um, display of uh, masculinity happens. Um, I think the time is not right to discuss it because the, um, the fears and the angers and the tempers have flown, but there will be another time when this discussion is focused upon. Any questions from the audience which uh, people would like to talk on this issue? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, in the first table there. Madam, as you rightly said, the garbage issue, the, we the Indians, we don't spend much for health and for public health is zero. If we could provide sanitation and garbage disposal, number, this problem, we, we may not be able to eliminate, at least we get half. And the sterilization and uh, vaccination is much, is prevention is, if you sterilize and vaccinate dogs, so many of our lives could be saved. In the hospital we come across, the rabies vaccine is expensive and um, multiple times we have to administer, people miss and there is no cure. So this is the priority for us. We talk about terrorism or we, we talk about black money, but the country has to be healthy. So we salute to your uh, endeavors. And young man, your name is not there. I hope the next time you will be in the Ashwin. front page. Thank you, NDT. I just I just wanted to add that. Um, so when you, you mentioned rabies, um, so um, in fact uh, um, last year there was a conference here in Bangalore, which um, uh, which the top World Health Organization experts. They said that the ABC program is actually impeding rabies control. Instead, mass vaccination should be done to reduce rabies. And yes, for dogs. Yeah. But instead, because it's being coupled with the it's ABC, being clubbed. It's being clubbed um, therefore, there's not enough money to do it, and, and municipalities are not doing it. Uh, my question to the panel is that the organizations which perform medical experiments uh, say that the end justifies the means. So, what is your take on that? Uh, Ashwin, let's, let's just have a word in from you. The Animal experiments are needed for medicine, for understanding. Where would we get our vaccinations from at the end of the oh. day, right? So they are right. 
but uh, I think the way it's done, the cruelty which is involved in it, that can, you know, should be lessened, or probably, I don't know if it can be done away with, yeah. right? But if we didn't have our vaccinations, if we didn't have all of this, then obviously we would suffer, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I've never understood this argument. It seems like you guys are all on the same side, just focusing on different levels of protection. There's only a small proportion of society that actively feels that cruelty to animals is okay. Nobody thinks it's okay. It's just, Norma, would you prioritize the life of a dog over the life of an endangered species? If those are the questions, and those are the questions, what would you do? No, I, think, I think the question is everybody agrees that you should not be cruel to animals. Unfortunately, the, not everybody. The problem no. is that when it affects something else, when it affects you as humans, then you say animals will stand down and the human will ride. Now, whether that is the way to look at it or whether we need to re-look at our thinking in society and ask the question, who will speak for the animals when we are setting out our development projects, when we are removing their forests, when we are encroaching into their territory? Who will speak? Who will be the voice for the bull and the elephant and the tiger and whatever? Then we would have a society where there is space for people and for the animals as is meant as planet Earth is meant to be. The discussion was about how the bull's uh, tails are broken, uh, chili powder is put, rubbed into their eyes before they're sent into the arena so that they're totally blinded and they are starved sometime before that and given uh, country liquor so that they don't know what they are doing, they're kind of overwhelmed and their senses are out of control and in this, in this state of terrible trauma and suffering, this whole um, display of uh, masculinity happens. Um, I think the time is not right to discuss it because the, um, the fears and the angers and the tempers have flown, but there will be another time when this discussion is focused upon. Mm -hmm.